Hello friends, welcome to our very own channel, Ammu and You, where I am Ammu, who loves narrating stories to you. I have narrated stories from various authors, various places, all over the world. And different yawners have also been explored. Today, I am doing a story, a rather horror story, trying to explore this yawner as well. I would love to get your comments on how you like the story. Today, the story that I have for you is written by the famous Edgar Allan Poe and the name of the story is The Black Cat. I married early and was happy to find my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife who had a really, really superstitious mind, maybe, also loved this one. Not that she was ever serious upon this point of superstitious that said that black cats were witches in disguise. Pluto, this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him and he attended me wherever I went about the house. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew day by day more moody, more irritable and more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife. At length, I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill used them. For Pluto, however, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when by accident or through affection, they came my way. My disease grew upon me, for that disease was like alcohol. And at length, even Pluto, who was becoming old, began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home, much intoxicated from one of my haunts about time, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him when, in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body. I took from my waistcoat pocket a pen knife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat and deliberately cut out one of its eyes from the socket. I blush, I burn, I shudder while I pen the damnable atrocity. When reason returned with the morning, when I had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse for the crime of which I had been guilty. I again plunged into excess and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented 
it is true a frightful appearance but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain he went about the house as usual i had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me and then came upon the spirit of perverseness yes the spirit of perverseness have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law merely because we understand it to be such the spirit of perverseness i say came to my final overthrow it was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself to offer violence to its own nature to do wrong for the wrong sake only that urged me to do what i did one morning in cold blood i slipped a noose about the cat's neck and hung it to the limb of a tree hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse at my heart hung it because i knew that it had loved me and because i felt it had given me no reason of offense hung it because i knew that in doing so i was committing a sin on the night of the day on which this most cruel deed was done i was aroused from sleep by a fire the curtains of my bed were in flames the whole house was blazing it was with great difficulty that my wife a servant and myself could escape my entire worldly wealth was swallowed up i am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and atrocity on the day succeeding the fire i visited the ruins the walls with one exception had fallen in this exception was found in a compartment wall not very thick which stood about the middle of the house and against which had rested the head of the bed about this wall a dense crowd were collected and the words strange singular and other similar expressions were being expressed i approached and saw the figure of a gigantic cat on the surface of the wall there was a rope about the animal's neck the impression was given with an accuracy truly marvelous when i first beheld this apparition for i could scarcely regard it as less my wonder and my terror were extreme the cat i remembered had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house upon the alarm of fire this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd by someone of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber the falling of other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty onto the wall in the substance of the freshly spread plaster the lime of which with flames and the ammonia from the carcass had then accomplished the portraiture as i saw it for months i could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat and during this period there came back into my spirit a half sentiment that seemed but was not remorse one night as i sat half stupefied in a den of more than infamy my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin or of rum which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment i had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes and what now caused me surprise was the fact that it was a black cat 
a very large one, fully as large as Pluto and closely resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite splotch of white covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand and appeared delighted with my notice. I at once offered to purchase it of the landlord. I continued my caress and when I prepared to go home, the animal just followed me. I permitted it to do so and soon it became a great favorite with my wife as well. Very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing and to flee silently from its odious presence. What added no doubt to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that like Pluto, it also had been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife. That humanity of feeling, which had once been my distinguishing trait and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps everywhere. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet. At such times, Although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from so doing, partly by a memory of my former crime. Let me confess it at once by absolutely dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil. Yes, even in this felon cell, I am almost ashamed to own that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the nearest chimeras it would possibly be to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair of which I have spoken. The reader will remember that this mark although large, had been originally very indefinite. And now I was indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity. And the brutal beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me. Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former, the creature left me no moment alone and in the latter, I started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face, incumbent eternally upon my very heart. One day, she accompanied me into the cellar of the old building. It followed me down the steep stairs and nearly throwing me headlong, exasperated me to madness, uplifting an axe and forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which had hitherto stayed in my hand. I aimed a blow at the animal. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife. I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished, I set myself with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one period, I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire. 
at another, I resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar. Finally, I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed. I had no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks that I would take out, insert the corpse and the wall would be plastered up just like before so that no eye could detect any suspicion. And in this calculation I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar I easily dislodged the bricks and deposited the body against the inner wall propped it in that position, relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. When I had finished, I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, here at least then my labor has not been in vain. My next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness. For I had at length firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet, meet with it the moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate. But it appeared the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger and forbore to present itself in my present mood. The second and the third day passed and still my tormentor came not. Once again, I breathed as a free man. The monster in terror had fled the premises forever. My happiness was supreme. Even a search had been instituted. But of course, nothing had been discovered. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of the police came very unexpectedly into the house. I felt no embarrassment whatever. They explored the house at length for the third or fourth time. They descended into the cellar. My heart beat calmly as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom and roamed easily to and fro. Gentlemen, I said at last, as the party ascended the steps, I delight to have allayed all your super suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen. And I must say that this is a very well constructed house, said one of them. In fact, excellently well constructed house. These walls... Are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. And here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily with a cane, which I held in my hand. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the arch fiend. No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry at first muffled and broken like the sobbing of a child and then quickly swelling into long, loud and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and of triumph such as might have arisen only out of hell conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony and of the demons that exult in the damnation. Of my thoughts, it is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with the red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. 
I had walled up the waltzer within the tube, the tome, the wall, the tome for the corpse and the beast. What shades of humanity we possess and it is really scary to even think of people reaching to a state where they can experience such feelings that make them perform such hideous actions. Hair splitting story. I hope you've liked it. Then please may I request you to like, share and subscribe. Press the bell icon to be updated on the channel. Thank you for listening to this story. Stay well, stay safe and wait for me till I come again soon with another story. Bye-bye.